Good morning, colleagues. As you walk in, we'll start in a couple moments. Just give people a moment to. But and nobody's walking in, no? They're only, <laughs> they're only, what, registering or something. Like exactly. That. Coming in through the ether and floating there somewhere in the distance. Um, good morning, everyone. I know more people will be joining us as we get going, but I'll um, get the show going. So today um, is a great day uh, for our 12th lecture in the series. So we've had 15 lectures lined up and this is the 12th. And it's my honor um, to have Slavinka Drakulic speak to us today. But even more exciting is I'm gonna pass the baton to um, one of our undergraduate students studying BCS at UC Berkeley, Alexander Pontich, and he's gonna do the introduction. So Alexander, please, by all means. Thank you, Zach. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Alexander Pantic. I'm a third year student at UC Berkeley. I'm majoring in history, political economy, and Slavic languages and literatures. I'm an avid reader of Yugoslav and post-Yugoslav literature, and my family comes from the former Yugoslavia, which is why it's my which is why it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Slavin Kandraković was born in 1949 in Rijeka, the main port city of what was then the Socialist Republic of Croatia one of the constituent republics of socialist Yugoslavia. After graduating from the University of Zagreb, she began her career as a journalist in the 1980s, writing for a number of Zagreb publications. She left Croatia at the onset of the Yugoslav Wars of Succession, having been labeled one of the witches of Croatia by nationalist detractors, who claimed that she and several other prominent female Croatian writers had betrayed their motherland by critiquing the mainstream nationalist ideology. During her prolific career as an author and journalist, she's written about feminism, Yugoslav wars, and Europe in the post-socialist era, the latter of which is the focus of her two collections of essays, the 1996 Café Europa and the 2021 Café Europa Revisited. The original collection was written and published in the immediate aftermath of the breakup of Yugoslavia, and was thus concerned with the experience of being a citizen of these new post-breakup states, discussions of early democratic and free market transitions, and the democratic traditions that would have to take hold among the post-socialist populations to overcome the negative legacies of their former political systems. Last year, Drakulic released Café Europa Revisited, a collection of essays that does just what the title suggests. It revisits the concepts that she wrote about 25 years ago, along with new considerations of the progress and regressions made in Europe since those early days when the so-called end of history seemed so imminent. In her journalistic work, Drakulic has contributed to a vast array of international publications, including the New York Times, The Nation, New Republic, Vox Europe, the New York Review of Books, Jutarni List, Eurozine, The Guardian, and many more. She's published several novels, including Hologrami Straha, or Holograms of Fear in 1987, Bozhanska Glad, or The Taste of a Man in 1995, and the 1999S, a novel about the Balkans, which was made into the 2010 feature film, As If I'm Not There. Along with Café Europa and Café Europa Revisited, some of her other nonfiction works include How We Survived Communism and Even Laughed, published in 1991, They Would Never Hurt a Fly, released in 2003, and A Guided Tour Through the Museum of Communism from 2009. Her work has been translated into over 20 languages. Her latest collection of essays seems at first glance to be an unusual departure from convention, revisiting a 25-year-old work and not simply republishing it with some revisions, but writing a completely new set of essays in response to what she wrote before. Drakulic's intentions become more clear, however, when we consider the extent to which Europe has changed and stayed the same since the 1990s. The original Café Europa discussed the future of post-socialism and especially the idea that democratization would not happen automatically. It would require societies to develop democratic norms and traditions, overcome the communist era corruption that permeated both private and public spheres, and make the switch from the collective we to the individual me, a conceptual step that Drakulic saw as critical to democracy. Looking at Europe today, it is clear that the democratic transition many imagined has not been realized. As Drakulic writes in Cafe Europa Revisited, although the continent has certainly seen successes since 1989, with many European states, East European states, excuse me, joining the EU, borders opening and markets expanding, European unity has been threatened over the last years, first by the financial crisis, and more importantly, by the refugee crisis, which opened the door for xenophobic far-right movements and politicians. Eastern Europe in particular has been overwhelmed by authoritarian leaders, 
many of whom have been elected and re-elected through ostensibly democratic means. Although Cafe Europa Revisited was published prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it anticipates many of today's most pressing questions regarding the resurgence of violence, the future of democracy, and the right of people to, to determine how they wish to govern their own states. In a turn that Draculich could not have predicted, it seems like the national identity that Ukrainians were struggling so hard to attain during the years of Russian interference in their country's affairs might be forming during the current war, as what it means to be Ukrainian becomes defined by a rejection of authoritarian imperialism. As I was rereading Draculich's two collections and thinking about her life's work, I was reminded again of how, how relevant the horrific experiences of the Yugoslav dis disintegration remain to this day. We seem to be once again witnessing the same kind of political rhetoric, violence, and suffering as if the lessons of history were never fully learned. I can't think of a social critic better than Slavenka Draculich to help us think through these lessons of history. Thank you everyone for being here and please join me in welcoming Slavenka Draculich to Berkeley. Morning Slavenka. Good morning to you, and uh, I am very pleased to be at least in this way connected to the West Coast and to Berkeley. Uh, I've been there once a long time ago, but uh, almost it's almost forgotten. Thank you, Sasha, for this beautiful uh, introduction. I don't think I have to add anything to that as far as I'm concerned. It could be, you know, I could leave the scene now, but this will not happen. I will still uh, stay here. Uh, however, thank you for your very kind and um, uh, words about uh, my work. Um, because I'm in the academic surrounding and because maybe some academic might uh, attend uh, this webinar, I also would like to say that I'm a writer and journalist, so it's not, uh, I'm not an, not an academic in my approach, in, in my work and in my book that uh, uh, Sasha mentioned, Cafe Europa Revisited, which I would like to focus on, on tonight is, um, is, of course, from another angle. I call it the frog view because it's from below. It starts with everyday life, with everyday small, um, uh, small observations and then working into something, uh, something bigger, recognizing the signs of important perhaps important themes and questions. Now, I would like to go back to the 9th of uh, November, 1989, which uh, you will, of course, remember that it was the day of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, which is important not only because of the collapse of the wall, uh, but also as a symbolic date of uh, collapse of communism. In our mind, this day is uh, something that we, when somebody says 9th of November, yes, this is, what happened then. And uh, uh, you know what uh, that the Soviet, that uh, communism collapsed, we used to call it in this part of the world, socialism. So communism collapsed uh, in the entire Soviet bloc, which of course was the Soviet Union, but also Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, German Democratic Republic or GDR, while Albania and Yugoslavia <clears throat> Well, communists too, but out of the block. What is interesting at that point is, I think, and also when you think, uh, think further, further back, when you go back in time, is that this war was unexpected. It was unexpected for its citizens and for the governments too. Uh, as I have to say, uh, very self-critically also, that they didn't do very much to overthrow the, the regime they were uh, living in. Uh, the most, I would say, was done in Poland, and uh, you remember Solidarity, which was Solidarity was a union, workers' union, but then it grew immensely in the 80s, and it had an enormous number of um, members, and it actually was completely the terrain, so to speak, was atmosphere was pre prepared for a change, but they themselves couldn't do very much because it was a martial law. At that time, Jaruzelski, you will remember him perhaps too. But Hungary and Czech Republic, or that Czechoslovakia at the time, they had started to articulate a little bit of political opposition. You will remember the name of Václav Havel. And in Hungary, certainly Viktor Orban, who was the one of the leading opposition, young opposition, and the scholar of uh, uh, 
of Soros, which is one of the paradoxes of his biography. Uh, there is a story in this book, Cafe uh, Europa Revisited, about him too. Uh, yeah, to ask ourselves uh, why didn't they do very much, uh, um, I think we have to have in mind, and this I'm speaking uh, for, for people who are not uh, specialists or don't, uh, are not specially interested, um, it, it's a totalitarian regime, the totalitarian regime that is banning uh, and punishing uh, all kinds of opposition in culture, or not to mention politics, and uh, I don't think that we have to go further than to mention the classical literature, in which you have, of course, read the uh, Let's um, mention just uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn or Shalamov, Shalamov or Nadezhda Mandelstam and uh, even George Orwell, who, who, whose book I liked in 1984, I liked very much because it did, it did uh, predict certain, certain elements that are even today very relevant, like, for example, the role of propaganda. <clears throat> So I think that the most the most surprised person was actually Gorbachev himself, or Gorby, how he was called at that time, um, because what he wanted to do, and now this is my, of course, uh, very simplified interpretation, is that uh, uh, he introduced two measures. He introduced the measure of glasnost and perestroika, that is liberalization of the media and economy, but it was uh, in, so to say, the aim was to, to change uh, uh, communism, to, to make it uh, better, to make it, uh, to improve it. This was his uh, idea. Uh, and um, on the other hand, there was also um, a decision not to go further in the arm race with the United States of America and not to use military power in any longer in the bloc. Uh, the fact that they didn't intervene when the start, things started to move in Eastern Europe was very, very important because, as you remember, Hungary in 56 and, and uh, uh, Prague in 68, they did move in with a, a considerable force. And there, there was no velvet revolution then, but now there was a velvet revolution, uh, blood, blood, meaning bloodless revolution. Um, Many, there are many reasons that it came about in this way. There are many reasons for this historical change. And if you think about that, uh, uh, how much of the future uh, had a society that couldn't, uh, that couldn't satisfy the basic needs of its uh, members. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, it, is, it, is, it was in the long run. Um, but this was very, very abrupt change that happened in 1989. Now, this is, this, my question is in this first book, Cafe Europa and Cafe Europa Revisited, how come, really, how come that most of us thought, fine, great, Velvet Revolution, democracy, uh, uh, capitalism, and that such a huge change in a huge part of the world is not having some, what should I say, big uh, consequences, uh, that something is going so smoothly, you no know, blood, uh, uh, how, how is it really so? Was it, was it so? And is it possible that the political change uh, comes and not much, uh, not much problematic happens after that? Well, I was curious and of course I, I went to see myself what happened. Uh, for the typical, I would say, the, the, the view uh, of Western Europeans at that time, uh, I use the anecdote with uh, um, my Dutch editor at Information. This is the Dutch daily paper. And we were talking, he said, well, you know, he is about 40 years old. And he said, well, we believe that now everything is all right, that we all have the same conditions. So from now on, the Eastern Europe will be fine. It, it will have democracy and capitalism, and it will develop in the, with our help, with the help of European Union, of course, and uh, it will just everything. So we didn't, he wanted to say, we didn't bother with that any longer. It was just everything is normal uh, now. 
again, could it be that the whole huge political and economic system collapses without causing important long-term consequences? And if so, what consequences? So um, I uh, first I traveled uh, uh, for, the, for the purpose of the book Cafe Europa and describing where I'm describing two of the several phases which I would like to, which I think uh, European, Eastern European societies, post-communist societies pass through uh, on, on the way, uh, on the way uh, to the future. Uh, I would call the first one idealization, idealization, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, and the other one imitation. But before that, I would like to tell you why did I use uh, this title, Café Europa, why Café? Because I think hmm, it's some cafe is not the same thing as a coffee shop, as a cavana, cavarna um, in various uh, languages here. Um, it is the place where, which is very comfortable. You sit there, you can eat a little bit. You, it's not just going in a bar and drinking a cup of coffee. You can sit, you can read. Uh, it's invented in, uh, actually in Vienna, in uh, Austro-Hungarian empire but uh, then spread throughout Europe, Eastern Europe especially, uh, a place where you can uh, read and discuss. And the we even have an expression for that. It's called coffee house politics. So this is the place which is typical European. I could also say Eastern European. Um, and the place where you can, so to say, discuss things uh, uh, that normally you couldn't discuss. Then, therefore, you could have a, a coffee uh, politics, which is uh, very important. It's not a real thing, but it's it's a kind of democratic place, so to say. Um, so, the, in my view, and there are others who, for example, Ivan Kraster, who agree with this, uh, with this, what should I say, stages that, that uh, uh, post-communist Europe passed through, is uh, idealization and especially before 1989. To us, I think it looked like um, uh, everything will be different one, and better once we become, uh, once we, as we used to say, go back to Europe. Uh, many of Eastern European bloc countries, communist countries did not in fact, uh, um, did not accept the idea that they, they are no longer in Europe because they are in the bloc. And of course, you are familiar with the term Central Europe that Kundera, in fact, invited just to somehow make a division uh, between, between East and West and between these countries, bloc countries be, uh, belonging to somehow to Russia. Um, this was the division after the Second World War and not much could be done about that, but they, their culture, their history, um, uh, it felt like belonging, uh, belong, being expelled actually of Europe. And this is uh, uh, why they say going back to Europe. To Europe is, uh, the idealization is this is, um, Europe is rich Western Europe. Always when you say Europe in post-communist countries, you meant Western Europe. So Western Europe is rich. This is some kind of a rich aunt that will, once we go there uh, to visit, give us everything and we will be also rich and beautiful and we will have better apartments and better cars, maybe better wives, certainly better uh, fruits and vegetables and everything will be much, much better than it is. Uh, it was like a dream actually. And where this dream came from? The dream came from, surprisingly or not, actually from advertising and the movies sort of from the media and from the talks of those who were able to visit and come, and come back. Um, in many countries, from many countries, one could not travel to the West, from Yugoslavia, of course, we could travel and had a little bit different attitude, different idea, uh, and felt much more connect connected, especially my generation. Um, so 70s and 80s, especially traveling abroad and going everywhere, it was, uh, it was just uh, in the West was an ordinary, more or less ordinary thing. And um, so it's, uh, I think uh, here the typical story is, um, uh, I know many of you Americans, you, you kind, you will, you will, um, you will perhaps laugh, but I mean, a big thing was, uh, a big thing, the biggest thing in my generations was to have blue jeans. 
blue jeans for my generation was the symbol of the West, of, of, of belonging, of, of being there where you want to be. Or so it was a, a completely different symbol, not only fashion symbol as it was in, a, in, in the West. So having a, a, a pair, having a pair of blue jeans, you you it was a big fight that you had to put on. I, for example, with my parents, with my father, my father absolutely forbid me to have a, a jeans because he was a, a communist. He was also Tito's partisan. He fought the war, and for him, um, this we are talking about seventies. Jeans uh, were symbol of all of that, and he absolutely didn't want me to have. And I was tempted also because I'm from Rijeka, and Rijeka is very close to Italian border to Trieste, where hordes of Yugoslavs would uh, would go there and. Uh, in the seven, in the eighties, especially to buy things that we didn't have, and one of them was blue jeans. So it was a typical on the border that you appear. Not me because I didn't need to do that, but many people were smuggling jeans, so they would put three, four pairs on them and travel like that, either with the bus or with the in the car or with the train. But this was one of the things that was very symbolic. And then if you would go, for example, with a pair of jeans to other Eastern European countries, for example, in Prague and Czechoslovakia, uh, you could sell those and and get uh, pretty much uh, pretty much uh, money for that. So this is uh, you know starting from jeans and and then uh, uh, going to all these kind of things that were not uh, available to us because we couldn't travel and couldn't and didn't have money to buy if we, even when we travel. When I say we, of course, I speak about. Uh, uh, all post-communist countries, and I myself have have some doubts. Should I use the expression "we"? Should I should I use "we"? And with what um, authority after the collapse of the of the um, communism? Why? Because before it was perceived as a bloc. Am I now in the position to use again "we"? I think I am, and the reason is that we still have a common a common. Um, past and the common past forms common mentality this is what i think now but i did something in that direction because i was bothered by this idea that all the communist countries are the same and everything is the same um i wrote a book which is i don't know if you it's available in the us and it's called a guided tour uh, through the museum of communism here i have one or oh, one edition not the american one and which is uh, uh, which is actually um, fables told by the animals, of which each represents one uh, former communist country. There is a, a dog for Romania, a bear for Bulgaria. Um, I don't really know what by heart. A raven for Albania, for Croatia, for sorry, for Yugoslavia. It is a a, a, a well-known uh, fact that Tito had a parrot. So this parrot is representing speaking indeed. And uh, uh, there is also a Polish cat, which belongs to General Jaruzelski. And this is where I try to show that not all countries, uh, although being communist and having this uh, common denominator, are not really um, inside. They are, uh, there are big differences. Um, so uh, now going back to 1989, it was a big shock. It was a um, big material, if you want, shock, big change, and it was also psychological. Uh, it was, uh, I, from my observation, it seems to me that the fact that you have so many things, that um, capitalism came, that uh, so many things became uh, available in these countries after living very, very poorly for very long. Um, in this way, seeing first the material face seems to me of this other life, seems to me that um, human rights, the freedom of expression, democracy somehow fell in the in, in in the background in the in the in the second plane. And it's no wonder because when I was traveling in 1990 um, to Bulgaria, Sofia, among other countries, for this book Cafe Europa, I'm still there. Uh, I, I was visiting shops, of course, and I remember uh, I was staying with a friend and went in the morning to 
buy milk and for coffee. And so I went down and I saw the queue and they told me the milk is coming a little bit later. And when I entered there in that shop, there was almost, I would say from your point of view or from my point of view at that time, because our shops were not like that, there was almost nothing to buy. There were a lot of, um, a lot of pickles. Uh, I remember that shelves with pickles. And I remember basic things like potatoes and onions and such things, but more than that, not much more than that. So if you have to wait for milk, then you can imagine how excited these people were when they finally got that. The trouble was that they didn't have very much money to buy, it, but on the other hand, everything was there. Um, now, from the political point of view, um, you can, and obviously, what happened is a, a main political switch, a big change from um, from uh, um, totalitarian to uh, to democratic institutions. This institution, basic democratic institutions, were installed and they were installed uh, very quickly. But many analysts at that time call that kind of democracy empty democracy. Why? because um, uh, political change, political rights were not understood and they were not exercised in a democratic way. So what persists and what was going on was that the old authoritarian, authoritarian base persisted in governing which would, would mean that, um, and it's even today the case, that people who are in power, who are voted through the democratic process, keep in mind Orban, uh, that they are acting out and uh, ruling and governing in the authoritarian way. And the only important thing in this, in that system is um, uh, to be a member of the party and to be close to the people who are in power. The, on the other hand, where these people were supposed to, to learn it, I mean, to learn about democratic process, to learn what is the other side uh, of uh, 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 democracy and of freedom. And this is a responsibility. The responsibility was really never learned, never, and not even until today. The problem with introducing a responsibility, individual responsibility in that system, it's still, uh, it's still uh, there. On the, on the level of um, transformation of uh, uh, economy, uh, it seems to me that what happened there is the, is, uh, the best uh, described as a very brutal uh, kind of capitalism uh, com coming in. And here is the important thing in this transition, as they called it then, and I guess it's still called now, is um, privatization of state ownership. Why is it important? It is important because, as you know, in these countries, not much was private. It was all owned by the, by the state or Yugoslav invention by the society. So how do you, it, it, it's a separate question. So, um, of course, the people who are closest to, to the power were best informed, and of course, they enriched themselves, which means that suddenly in society that is not used to big differences between rich and poor, suddenly there is a big gap because very few people got very, very rich. And then here, there, somewhere there, this is the root of, um, uh, of corruption of corruption that later on developed to the, to, the, to the level, to the size, to the method, to the system that is, I think, uh, basically could be compared as a cancer. Uh, seems to me that this is the kind of cancer of this kind of, a, of a former communist, post-communist societies. Uh, when I say brutal form, of, uh, brutal capitalism, brutal form of exploitation, it's, it includes, of course, a lack of uh, any care for the, for the workers' rights. Uh, the unions were dissolved immediately and mass layoffs, which made these people 
the, the, these people are very insecure. If you would find yourself in the middle of your life, life being 40 or being somewhere there without job, uh, probably without any means to survive, it was a very difficult time for many, many people. Um, but there was another element in that. Uh, for example, in GDR in Germany, Mm, uh, you know that the uh, union between uh, East and Dance in GDR happened almost immediately. And then uh, <laughs> in privatization uh, of, uh, East, uh, of a state property in the East, what happened is that then the new companies would uh, introduce their people as the bosses, people from the West. And not only that, but there was a different in wages. Um, the explanation was that life is cheaper there. It might be so, but in 20 years, uh, that changed too. Uh, it created something, the attitude towards the general attitude of the West. Now I'm very much generalizing, but you will find examples in, in, in my book. It's um, uh, that, uh, mm, it, it created the feeling in the East that, uh, that we are the second class citizens. And that's not a very nice feeling. And then it began also the European Union uh, taking in some countries, including some countries which were frankly not really prepared and not some other countries. And then there was a war in former Yugoslavia and so on. Anyway. What I'm saying is that it is, um, it was a feeling of somehow of um, not, not being fairly treated. Um, one phenomenon that, for example, when you're speaking about Germany, hit Germany is depopulation. Women left, women are those who left first and went to the West looking for jobs. And jobless men stay behind. And they were very, and still are very, very bitter. There are many reports about that. And their anger is creating a fertile soil for, uh, for the right, for uh, uh, um, alternative for Deutschland party, which is now in the government, as you know, is, uh, was built on this kind of resentment of this kind of anger of these uh, of this people. Now, these are two phases that I would, I could say that I tried to describe in the previous book, but then of course, after, so many years that the decade, decades of, uh, um, of this kind of, of uh, change after it happened, uh, I wanted to see what, what, happened, what happened further. And I felt like, okay, let's do another, uh, another visit to, to Cafe Europa and see what's happening, what's happening there. Of course, I, I live here, so it wasn't um, a very big thing to go around and but I wanted to visit these places and pay attention to the changes. And then um, I found this disappointment as, as another, let's say, uh, stage in the stage in the uh, uh, in development of uh, uh, post-communist countries. And um, also um, rebellion, also rebellion. Uh, the first sign for me that something, uh, not only for me, but I mean the first sign that something is, is um, that people are not very happy was that uh, um, it was nationalism. And uh, it doesn't have to do with the war, in, wars in former Yugoslavia, but it's, uh, if we bear in mind that the European Union was built as an uh, end anti-national superstructure against uh, wars, uh, also economic, but I mean, I'm speaking now about another level, then it's um, these episodes of nationalism cause worry, but they on, at that time, 20 years ago, they were on another level. They were on the level of talking about uh, national identity, talking a national ident identity. So in a, word, in a way they were, um, theoretical, um, what, is national, what is national identity? What, is, uh, what role is church playing in this national identity? The problem was that national identity in post-communist countries was defined as a very, what's the word? As a very um, uh, solid kind of thing. It wasn't 
There is no improvisation. There is nothing. I mean, nationalism, a national identity is something built out of stone. It's something, uh, something uh, formed, something, uh, nothing you could add or nothing you could take from it. While we all know that this, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, nations are imagined communities. So that it is, but it was interpreted in such a way that, um, as if it is, I thought, some kind of defense. Defense against what? Um, then it was also interpreted as nostalgia for the past times, which I don't agree at all about. Why? Because you might have nostalgia uh, for the past time because you were younger then, you had a job there, you had some kind of a different life. But I think nostalgia, political nostalgia, not. I, I, I do not really think that people felt nostalgia for the political regime. Nobody could feel nostalgia for a political regime. Um, it was also interpreted as anti-globalism, as a fear of new. And perhaps these interpretations are all, uh, all right. Um, in fact, I think that former communist countries ended up in some kind of a problem with some kind of problem of identity and this kind of definition, uh, which uh, today is different. Anthropologists are saying that uh, uh, individual and national identity is something that is built, that is filled, built from some kind of different elements and is, ch is to be changed, is changing. It's very fluid, and that's the modern word, and more like a sandwich than like a, a stone uh, block. Mm. And then, of course, there was this, uh, there was this 1991-1985 uh, wars in former Yugoslavia, where there was accent on nationalism, and uh, some kind, at some point it looked as if uh, Yugoslav wars exported nationalism um, which I am uh, really not sure because if you look, for example, I don't know, look for uh, uh, Catalan nationalism, look for Italian nationalism, Liga Nord. So nationalism is something that exists in the country, especially um, countries that are uh, composed from, let's say, different people and so on. Um, but uh, uh, it is the, the whole idea is that you, you don't have to go into the war and make, uh, and make your own state, uh, at least it was uh, uh, before, uh, before, the, before the wars in Yugoslavia. Now, um, this feeling of second class citizens in, in Europe in, um, persisted and if nationalism was a sign of it, um, it was also disappointment. It, and when I say rebellion, then I'm thinking about Viktor Orban's illiberal, illiberal democracy, because he said, okay, we will do it, but we'll do it our way. We'll do it differently. Um, we have our own culture, we have our own language, we have a, a why should we do it your way? We tried to imitate and it didn't really work why imitation didn't work. I think it couldn't work because we have different kinds of background. In the countries, if we are imitating Western democracies and we are from the countries where there was no democracy before, there is no tradition of democracy, a little bit in uh, Czech Republic and so on. But I mean, it, the imitation cannot really work. But the liberal democracy is then going into a completely different uh, direction. Um, another, another, Something happened then that uh, um, even make this argument of nationalism and of fear for your language, for your culture, for your religion, um, even worse it is, uh, and your identity, national identity, even more fragile. Um, and this is a refugee wave that hit uh, uh, Europe in 2015-2016. It was um, a, a big wave of people coming out of Europe. They were all out of Europe. They were coming from Middle East, from even from Africa. They were coming from, I, I don't know, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, they were war refugees, there's no doubt about that. 
but they uh, they amplify this fear of uh, foreigners. Fear of foreigners, however, was there before. It, it didn't come with uh, and nationalism as a reaction on the other side. It was there before, and it was um, uh, also very much, what should I say, pushed forward in the this brewing fear of foreigners. Uh, xenophobia was uh, amplified by the terrorist attacks in France, if you remember that in uh, and Belgium in 2015, 2016. So when a million, more than million, 1.7 million of refugees uh, out of Europe entered Europe and on somehow all in one uh, wave, if one can um, say, to, uh, say so, um, then came, uh, it caused general panic, I think, and uh, also, uh, kind of rebellion. Um, everything was fine until uh, Angela Merkel uh, invited them to come to Germany and stay there. While they were passing through the countries, like, I don't know, from Greece to Serbia to Croatia to Austria and so on, everything was fine. People were bringing them blankets and water and sandwiches and everything. But when there was this, a danger that they will not go further but stay there, then this was causing uh, problems and panic. And uh, uh, Orban was first who raised a razor blade um, uh, fences on the, on the border. And everybody was, of course, shocked. Oh my God, uh, razor blade, how inhuman that is. Uh, very soon, everybody was doing pretty much the same or also psychologically, which is very, very, very <laughs> important. Um, Orban was the one who first said, it will ruin our culture, we don't want them. It is interesting that Eastern European, former communist countries were first, they were leaving and saying, no, we don't want them. European Union there showed their, um, uh, they couldn't unify around this question. Uh, they brought the, 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 some kind of a rule that uh, they are going to divide among the countries. There will be certain quota to, for, the, for the people, uh, uh, refugees to, to, to each country, but it really never came through because people just uh, rebelled. They didn't want to take it. And again, it was Orban who was leading this kind of, uh, kind of thinking and saying, we don't want our culture, our tradition, our way of life, our Christianity, it will be in jeopardy and we do not want to. Here Merkel plays an important role. This is something that, um, that from Mother Teresa to, to her end, I think, and, uh, but I, I'm afraid I can't go <coughs> into this, um, further into this. Uh, but of course there is a story in the book about that. Now, what was the political consequences of this um, wave of refugees coming? That's very interesting because it was the, it was the fear, uh, the latent fear or manifested fear of uh, Europeans, of people in, in all countries, not only in Eastern Europe, was um, that rise of the right, right wing parties everywhere from uh, alternative to Deutschland to true Finns, mind you, Finland, even before the uh, uh, refugees. First of all, Finland doesn't take, didn't take any refugees. And then you have true Finns who got 20% of votes and never anybody ever heard of them because they were a new party or Swedish Democrats for that matter. There were some very small party 10, 15 years ago, I think 10 years or 12 years ago, they were a very small party and now they are third, um, but even in this election, they might come as a second party in Sweden. And they were building, this is what is important, they're building their, uh, uh, their credibility, their, their political platform, mainly on one thing, and this is anti-refugee politics. This is what is very important. Uh, you might remember Kaczynski, one of the brothers is still uh, in power in, in Poland, but all these local Kaczynskis, uh, 
like Jansha in Slovenia or Vucic in Serbia, they were following the lead of Orban and uh, 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 into, into this, uh, uh, into this anti-refugee and authoritarian direction. Now there was a big, um, a big research some years ago about support for authoritarian versus democratic governments. And I have to say that the Eastern European post-communist countries, they came first. They were not so much for democratic governments, but much more for authoritarian leadership. And if you ask yourself uh, why, I think the, the, the answer is rather, rather, hmm, rather obvious. And this is because they are used to it. And you cannot, you cannot. My, my aim, my, my interest it was to, to show one thing. That it, and this I think is a long term consequence that a change, a, a political change, you can do it overnight, but the change in mentality of people, in their habits, in their traditions, in their way of thinking, in their way of being, in their way of eating, is much slower than political changes. This was the only objective of showing this uh, concrete, what should I say, examples. Uh, 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 from the frog point of view in the uh, in, in in the book that uh, yeah, I as a journalist found that this uh, that this works very well with the with the public to develop story from uh, the small examples of every, everyday life. Uh, so what what shook Europe is um, is uh, uh, this refugee crisis, and then uh, five years later. There was another big shock for Europe, and this is Brexit. Now to us, we have got used to it, but this was at a point where, where Brits announced that they want to leave. It was uh, unthinkable. It was unthinkable for, for that any country would leave European Union at that point. And uh, we, I think we were all hoping that uh, Brits will not leave European Union, but it happened on the 31st of January, 2020. They sailed like a ship. They keep, couldn't sail like a ship because there are so many connections, but they decided to leave European Union. And that was, uh, I'm also, I'm here mostly talking about psychological elements you know, of this divorce, so to say, psychological elements of the divorce. It was, it was really very difficult to, to even understand why, how. Uh, it, was, it was a big blow. And uh, because the idea of European Union is to, to come closer together. And it seemed as if it seemed at that point, a couple of years ago, that European Union is in fact somehow dissolving. First of all, this gap between East and West still persisting. And then Brexit, it was rather shaky structure at that um, at that point, but, but very soon, a couple of months, not even a couple of months, maybe two months after Brexit formally happened, another event, unpredictable, again, I mean, predicting future is a very hard, hard job. So what happened is it was as unpredicted as the collapse of communism, and um, it changed again, once more, the general atmosphere in the uh, European Union. And that was Corona epidemic of mass proportion. Suddenly you have a, a, a modern plague and nobody expected and nobody, I mean, how could it be that there is, a, that there is an illness and, and virus that is absolutely uh, changing uh, the habits of uh, the rules, uh, the way of living. I mean, it was, it is speaking of shock, that was really a shock. Um, uh, what it did to Europe is not very nice because it looked as if European Union is uh, this, not dismember it, I couldn't say that, but it's more and more falling apart because suddenly the internal borders, borders that didn't exist any longer. You could travel from far north to the far south without stopping at the border, showing your passport, nothing. 
that suddenly the borders are not razor blade borders, but suddenly the borders are there. The borders are uh, again, there again. And that was shocking. First of all, they couldn't unite about um, rules and regulations. In one country, you had to show this. In the other country, you have, at the beginning, it was a terrible confusion. I think French were stealing masks from China from the or other needles or God knows what from the packages that came to the, for, uh, for German, no, or the other way around, maybe Germans. It was total confusion. The point is that the borders appear and it looked very ugly because there were stops, there were prohibitions, there were um, different regulations, traveling uh, regulations, lockdowns. I mean, it was a total chaos. Uh, before this vaccine appeared. When the vaccine appeared, it was a bit easier. It was, um, uh, it was, it was functioning better. There were, there were, there was more, so to say, uh, rule of law. Um, but what was interesting is to see in that situation that um, what is the weakness? What is the weakness of European Union in that particular? aspect of a healthcare system. And it turned out that it is the infrastructure, the health system in the hospitals, doctors, nurses, the physical conditions of their work. Poor countries like Romania, for example, or Bulgaria had not enough beds, had not in, in, enough uh, respirators, had no syringes, had no sheets, had no doctors, not nurses. It was well, Western cities had better conditions and I had to vouch for that because I was, I, it is a year now that I ended, two years now that I ended up in the hospital with Corona in Sweden. Um, my husband is Swedish and we partly live in Sweden too. So it was um, April, two years ago uh, when we both ended up in the hospital, but he, uh, uh, he was out in a couple of days and I had a very, uh, a very bad case of corona, so I had to go to a respirator. I was a month and a half in the hospital, and out of that, I was a week on a respirator. Now, if I would have been in my country where I was born, and we also live partly, and this is Croatia, I don't know if at that point there would be respirators enough for all patients who needed it. This is what I mean what I, when I say infrastructure. Infrastructure sounds like an abstract word, but in reality, this is it. I don't know if I would have, uh, uh, if there would be a possibility for me to survive there. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, better conditions, better material conditions mean a lot in such a situation. And you can have even the same rules and regulations but on the other hand, um, you cannot apply them because, because the conditions are different. So this was a very, I would say, all in all, very ugly experience, especially because my favorite card, which is European Health Card, which I think is one of the building elements of Europe, um, European Union became meaningless. You could not, you couldn't get help with this. You go in another country, the idea is that in the, in the case of emergency, you go to another country, you get help. Normally you do, but not in this case. In this case, uh, turn out that you can get help only in a domicile state. And that was also not very nice to, uh, to realize. Yeah. So um, in every, almost every difficult situation, the weaknesses of, of, of a system show up, that's very clear. And then you can learn and then you can improve it. But um, uh, this was a big, big blow until again, unpredictable happened. I mean, when you think about that, Europe is not a boring place to live. Um, what happened is when European Union was on the brink of falling apart, um, what happened is and changed the face of EU and maybe even more is the war in Ukraine, which started on February 24th. Um, of course, it's not in the book, it's, uh, but you cannot not to address it in such a, such a situation. 
who I will only mention, and then we can talk about that later because I would like to finish with that, is that uh, again, unpredictable and unimaginable happen. And this is um, that uh, European Union united. It finally functioned like a group. It united in the opposition to Russia. It united in uh, uh, more than ever before. If Putin's idea was that the war in Ukraine would divide the European Union, it didn't happen, not so far. Also NATO, organization that seemingly was superfluous, there is nothing happening really, woke up and suddenly it was not only started to act, but now Finland and Sweden want to join in because the fear that that war calls is nothing to be compared with the war before. And that is because they say, oh, the first war after the Second World War. No, it wasn't the first war. The first war was uh, 1991, 1995 wars in former Yugoslavia. So several things happened. One, unification of EU. Other, uh, uh, acting or, or strengthening NATO. And then something that Ukraine was fighting very long with and for, and this is building its national identity. It finally uh, uh, cemented its national identity because national identity is unfortunately almost always built uh, in the opposition to, to someone else's national identity. So, um, we can say it is an interesting consequence, consequences interesting, but pro proving that uh, Europe is, European Union is like, a, or Europe for that matter, is like a living organism that is changing all the time. To conclude, I would say that there are, for well, Eastern Europe, if we are still sticking to, to this division, and I think, unfortunately, it is like that, former communist country has problems, still problems with, democracy, still problems with national identity, still problems with corruption, which I think it's the biggest threat, biggest problem, and the biggest break in the, in the whole system. And uh, the problem with attitude to their own past, to history, because what we had before in the post communist countries is you had to deal with the official official history. Um, this is the history interpreted or uh, by the Communist Party and controlled by the Communist Party. Um, and many of these, some of these countries had also other problems like, for example, being, being the fascist countries during the Second World War. Um, I think that the stories in the book about the Prague, about Ukraine, about Holocaust stories are telling us um, why knowing your own history is important. And I think it also shows, this war shows the same, because what we are speaking here about is war propaganda. The less you know, the more manipulated you are, that there is a more space for manipulation. And especially vulnerable in that respect is uh, the younger generation in the post-communist countries. Why? Because their parents and their grandparents don't want to talk about communism. They said, it's finished, this chapter is finished, we don't want to forget about it. But it also means forget about your history. Um, and uh, as uh, the American uh, historian Timothy Snyder said, history without memory is impossible. But memory without, without history is dangerous. Uh, is memory without history possible? Yes. And it consists of official history created by the Communist Party that then in return makes gap between memory, collective memory and individual memory. And this, it, it becomes emotional. And if emotions are involved, it is the subject to propaganda it's easier to become a subject of propaganda. I am only interested, I'm only speaking about that one element because this is what interests me, how the war 
because this is the big question. And everybody said, how is it possible that we have the war in Europe now again? Um, and what I'm saying, it's propaganda because by decades of communism, you are conditioned to believe authority. You believe leader, you believe state-owned media um, as a source of information. And the role of propaganda is creating the enemy. Before sending these people out to Ukraine, you have to turn them into the enemy. You have to tell them you are going to save Ukraine from the Nazis. And this is what you are doing there. And they have to believe it because this is the only way they could act that they, uh, 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 as they are acting, for example, committing war crimes in Bucha, which you all heard about. Um, so this, I think it's partly perhaps uh, an explanation, how is it possible? But in any case, I would just repeat uh, um, as a conclusion, his attitude to history, it's really a big problem in post-communist countries. And again, history without memory is impossible and memory without history is dangerous. And we are witnessing that right now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Slovenka. Um, and Georgia, welcome back. Um, yeah, I can't even begin to fully process that. But Georgia, I'll let you um, take over with the moderation for the Q&A. Thank you, Zenke. Thank you, Slavinka, for, for the wonderful talk and for walking us, not just through the cafe culture of Eastern and Central uh, Europe, but through these stages, um, stages in this seemingly endless process of uh, 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 transformation. transition, yeah, yeah. transformation, yeah, which, which, which um, you know, continue to be quite, quite uh, uh, unpredictable. Uh, I have some questions that I would like to ask, but I also want to ask our audience to type, um, type their questions into this Q&A function that's at the bottom of the screen. I think we've already received one question, and I think Sasha Pantage wanted to ask a question as well. Is that right, Sasha? That's right. Thanks, Professor. Um, so I, I wanted to ask something related to the kind of authorial process of revisiting your own work 25, you know, 25 years uh, after publishing Cafe Europa. And just because uh, I'm, I'm curious if while you were writing and publishing Cafe Europa in 1996, did you did you consider that at one point you would revisit it, revisit it? Because it's clear that in the book that in the in the collection that you have a sort of more realist uh, conception of what Europe's path after uh, after socialism needs to look like in order to kind of attain some kind of democracy. You know, you, you're not you're kind of critiquing the people who think that sort of naive to say that democracy can automatically happen. And so did you in, envision yourself, you know, however many years down the line, revisiting at some point? And also just what, what was it like once you did decide to revisit it? What was it like reading your own words? Uh, I, I'm sure you looked at them at various points, but, you know, and comparing the two uh, perspectives of today and that kind of early post Yugoslav breakup and early, you know, days of new countries joining the EU and everything. But I have to say, I did not envision myself going anywhere because I was completely, I, I'm just curious, you know, I think one, the most important uh, element that the journalist needs is, is curiosity because if you are not curious then, I mean, you can be better or worse, you can write, uh, you have a style or not style, but curiosity is something that you can't without. And uh, also because there was such a big difference uh, between uh, the country where I lived, Yugoslavia, and these other countries, which I also visited before, I visited these countries. I never was in Russia, but I visited these countries before, and I was really curious about what has changed. And what triggered off the whole idea of visiting and looking around is that I saw suddenly it's really on the on the you know on the on the street level. It's um, um, it's you see suddenly the bars and the bar is called uh, Paris and you see a hotel and it's called, I don't know, Hollywood. And you see this tendency of this desire to belong somewhere else, to be, and to be recognized as something else, as 
Europe, you know. So this tendency, this dream to be somewhere else, to do it, to uh, it's um, uh, one of the scenes that I always remember. Uh, it, it's a funny little scene. I am again in Sofia, Bulgaria, and um, in the downtown, you know how these cities, they were very much run down during the socialism. And in the old part of the town, in uh, there are now new boutiques. For example, there is a quartier, and then there is some vegetable old shop, and then there is here another, let's say, gap, or I don't know, some brand shop. But when you would walk on that on that pavement, you walk, and there are holes, potholes in the, uh, and there are, you know, it's mud and dirt, and then you come in front of Cartier, and that shop, in front of the shop is asphalted. And you make three steps further, and <laughs> there is no asphalt. And then you make three steps further, and there is again, it was a patchwork, and it was so fascinating uh, to see that. So from this uh, really very small, observations, I then try to, to build this picture in the first book. And then, of course, uh, 30 years later, my publisher, uh, uh, Penguin Random House, said, well, okay, it's going to be now 30th anniversary. Of course, I was aware of that. It would be good to, you know, uh, to uh, somehow we came to the idea that it would be good to look again into that and do that project, and I did it, and it was meant to be published in, uh, at the anniversary, but it, because of various other reasons, came a little bit, I, I think, a little bit too late, too late, but also too early, because two things I could not put in the book were, you know, were, were Brexit and, uh, and also this, uh, uh, this health crisis, which, in any way, if there is, a, there is some kind of, a, I don't know, new edition or something, Already uh, Japanese who are translating this book are saying, okay, we want this book, but please write for us an introduction with explanation, with addressing the war in Ukraine. So already there is a tendency to somehow, you know, to complement, to finish in that way. Yeah. I don't know how much it answers your question, but uh, that's how I, it's no big ideas behind it. <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much. But this is, I think this is something else that Sasha mentioned in his introduction. There is this um, almost preternatural, <laughs> strange ability uh, that you as a, as a social critic have to predict what is unpredictable. Sure, with none of us saw COVID coming, none of us. There are a lot yeah, of things that we... It, yeah, but it, it feels like prediction, maybe. Maybe a reader sees that as a prediction but to me it's not an you know what it is to me to me it is knowing where I come from knowing the material knowing that it cannot be in any other any other way mm -hmm. so it, and it, I mean so so a sulky girl in Ukraine it's an essay in your second uh, second uh, 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 collection in, you're revisiting the old cafe Europa um, and and it, you obviously wrote that before the invasion happened, but a lot that you wrote seems to be relevant. So that's what I mean by the strange power yes, to, to I two, three the years. The element of history, of knowing your own history, it, it, it proved to be just what I was talking about and how important it is. Uh, but as I said, it's, uh, it's only from knowing how we are, you know, in what way we think, in what way we... Uh, we live our, our daily life that uh, that I somehow it it's so it's not knowing the future it's actually knowing the knowing your own situation knowing where you come from knowing the uh, mentality of, of the people that uh, that looks then like uh, some kind of a of a prediction yeah mm -hmm. so no, knowing those habits that we have in, in, yes. inherited yeah. from the past that are difficult to break but I think it would be the same for you if you would find yourself in my city. You would recognize things and you would say, okay, mm -hmm. but this is not going to work as you think it would, it should. Mm -hmm. actually. I mean, very much so. I recognize having lived through the wars of Yugoslav succession, I recognize the same, ty same type of men fighting uh, the same type of war, using the same means of, uh, uh, of war. Uh, the same in, in you and the same words. The, the same, same words, the same words, right? So using using women as weapons of war, destroying Absolutely. cities in exact same way. So for all of us coming from the former Yugoslavia, this is unfortunately horrifically so deja, yeah. de, uh, deja, deja yeah. vu. Uh, and um, 
then yeah so that's that's i was going to invite you to to, to comment on that uh, uh, yeah, a little is, bit this is the question more. how similar or how not similar it is i think it's first of all similar to the war uh, in wars in former yugoslavia in the element of um, in the ideological element you know in the sense of this preparation for the war in this sense of propaganda war propaganda writing about it, uh, uh, creating the enemy, uh, saying these people are the enemy, because without that you cannot send the soldiers without psychological preparation, in the sense that they have to be sure that what they are doing, they know they are people, they know that if they are killing other people, uh, somehow they have to have justification for that. The biggest taboo in human life in all culture is to kill. So you cannot kill if you do not have absolute certainty that what you're killing is uh, doing is a good thing. You are defending, you are you know, doing some very novel thing. And that was also uh, the same thing in preparation of wars in uh, Yugoslavia. But the big difference, and also this justification into going in because you are freeing somebody or helping somebody, that's also a repetition of Milosevic method. But what is very different and also very sad in comparison, it is the reaction to the war. The war in a first war from Croatia to Bosnia and so on was treated from uh, the West as if it would be some small fire in the backyard. It's nothing dangerous. It's not, well, they are, you know, there are thousand years enemies and they are killing each other wild people from the Balkans, you know, this kind of prejudice is that it's very painful because you can ask yourself then, well, wait a minute, how come that these people live for so long together and they were not killing each other? Some had somebody or something had to make them kill each other. Now, so I am the most interested now, now that it's writing about Ukraine, I'm most interested in this propaganda system. Uh, but uh, the big difference is that now it is, a serious thing because of the threat of the nuclear war and because Russia is in there. I mean, if it would have been again, let's say Albania against, I don't know, some other country, I mean, or Bulgaria, it's, it's all irrelevant compared, compared, not comparable to Russia and Ukraine because Russia is huge. It has, a, 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 it's one of the biggest, um, military forces in, in the world, although as we can see, not very efficient, but they have this, uh, they have uh, nuclear arms and therefore everybody is reacting. It is afraid, it is a fear that creates an incredible situation in Europe because on the other, on one hand, everything is going as usual as normal. And on the other hand, you have this <clears throat> Damoclos sword uh, over your, head and you really do, you cannot, it is really unimaginable. So this treatment of the war that, I mean, we couldn't import the, uh, there were so many prohibitions and uh, Bosnians couldn't import the arms, there was prohibition of import. And then they were, you know, until Americans came there and said, okay, now uh, basta, let's go to Dayton and you will sit here until you sign. I mean, the war wasn't over. But that was not to be in its, uh, in no way compared to the situation today. So yes, we know, we, we see the same, but on the other hand, it's not the same. And it's really scary, not only for Europe, but I think even wider. Uh, it's, uh, that's the biggest difference, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's, that's, that, that much is, uh clear certain ethical order was at stake uh, when the former Yugoslavia was uh, uh, disintegrating and here it seems the entire world order uh, uh, is changing and a lot more is, is so is even if nothing let's say the war stops now tomorrow still so many things have changed and already I mean we already feel the economic pressure of this already the prices are up here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to buy a petrol, the prices are already uh, uh, skyrocketing. So, I mean, on the most banal level, the life has changed mm -hmm. already. Right, right, right. Um, food supplies and not just in, not just yes, in Europe, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's already uh, 
Mm -hmm. the, you the, yeah, so, so to say, extract yourself from, from this situation. There is no way. You, you mentioned before we started, you mentioned that yours, they would not hurt a fly uh, a collection of, of essay was translated two or three years ago in, into Ukraine. The Ukraine yes. Ukraine. Yes. Uh, so it's an it's, it's again talking about the similarities between these two conflicts. This is a book course, for those of in in audience the, that the don't know. The first question that every Ukrainian uh, uh, journalist has is to compare Yugoslav wars with the war now. Of course, they recognize. I mean, they know what Milosevic is. It's uh, it's comparable on one level, of course. And obviously, it was one of the. I have four books translated in Ukrainian, but this uh, this one so to say, hit the nail at, at this particular moment, especially after massacre in Bucha. And be, because that would be compared to, to Srebrenica or to Vukovar. To Vukovar, yeah, yeah, yeah. Destroying uh, there the is a, Oh, yes, yes. Uh, um, there is a question uh, that we received from Michael Goodman, um, and he's inviting you to comment more on nostalgia as a phenomenon. I think this was in response to you bringing up nostalgia for the old regime uh, uh, so the question is why do, don't i speak more about nostalgia or oh, nostalgia she, she just she she uh -huh. uh, he uh, said that uh, he said what about the phenomenon of nostalgia uh, there is an interesting this is interesting question because there was uh, i mentioned it in the book but i didn't of course uh, have a uh, um, I could mention every single thing in, in my lecture, and this is that I think it was some 10 years ago, if I'm not, or maybe it was on the 10th anniversary of uh, uh, unification. Um, uh, it was a big research made about just about nostalgia or nostalgia. Uh, that is longing for the previous life, lo longing for, for GDR. As I said, my opinion was that my opinion is that it is not a political uh, nostalgia, but it is it, it is still nostalgia for um, security. First of all, those people who feel that before they had something and they were secure in a, in a cage, but still secure. And this uh, uh, result was of this research that many people say of my generation and older uh, older. Uh, it was, uh, I can't remember any longer the, the percentage, but it was a considerable number who 30 or 40 percent who felt that uh, they felt safer, they had a job, it was uh, peace, and they were not exposed to insecurity. So, but what was astonishing in that research was that very many young people felt nostalgic. How could they feel nostalgic if they were young? They didn't experience, they were born either at the end or uh, uh, before the end of, uh, before the collapse, how could they feel any of that? Of course, from the kitchen, from the table where they have dinner with parents, maybe from there, because there is no other way to, to, um, to feel nostalgia for young people. So it's turning into, into the myth and the myth of literature, the myth of uh, films, um, uh, it is, it's no longer reality. What young man, young person sees in former GDR, it's not reality. It is again, another kind of a dreamland, another kind of a myth. These seem to be the landscapes that we are moving through, through right? From, from the imagination about fine medical blue jeans <laughs> now but, to- But do you, to, you <laughs> won't remember you're too young, but blue jeans were really, really, uh, a big thing. <laughs> no, I, I do remember going to Trieste and putting on mm. the shoes that we bought oh, there. And then we made several movies that were made about blue jeans. I mean, it's really, when you think today about it, especially for the Americans, how could, you know, how? how uh, <laughs> one, one thing, one item, blue jeans. Oh, I had big yeah. fights with my father. <laughs> well, thank you so much. If there are no more questions from the audience, uh, I would like to thank you and thank all of you in attendance uh, for, for, for uh, being here today. And, and many thanks to ISIS of the Institute for uh, Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies for organizing this event, in particular to uh, Zach Kelly and 
Jeff Pennington. I hope, uh, Slavinka, that we can bring you uh, to Berkeley in person. You well, know, once this is great, are but over. I was very pleased because I think when people have no questions that I, that it is a good sign. It means that I have a, give some explanations so they don't need uh, sub questions. This is very, <laughs> like, oh. if I would be a professor, I would be also very, very pleased. <laughs> Zach, thank you very much. And I really join you in your thanks and uh, also in hopes to see you all one day live. Sasha, thank you very much for, again for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for everything. Thank you again. All the best. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Bye.